lovers and welcome to 21 Conversations, the 2021 Greensboro Bound Literary Festival. I'm Dabney Sanders, board chair of the Greensboro Literary Organization. Greensboro Bound is so excited to present to you these 21 Conversations, our effort to create something unique and special for our community within the confines of our continued virtual environment. 21 Conversations pays homage to North Carolina's rich literary history while broadening our tent to welcome in voices from outside of our own microcosm of experience. This featured presentation is but a taste of the 52 authors that we have gathered together in a series of delightful, sometimes unexpected, but always edifying conversations. Since our inception, Greensboro Bound has been committed to providing programs just like the one you were about to watch, 100% free to our community. And in order to do that, we need the financial support, both big and small, of readers just like you. Please support Greensboro Bound by giving now. The text to give phone number as well as our website are on your screen. A sustaining gift of just $15 a month or the cost of a single children's book will help us remain financially solvent throughout the year. I also want to take a moment to thank our sustaining supporters without whom Greensboro Bound would not be possible. Our utmost gratitude to the Edward M. Armfield Senior Foundation, the Ruth Lands Memorial Fund, and Arts Greensboro for their continued belief in our vision to bring together readers and writers of all genres, ages, ethnicities, identities, and voices to foster an understanding of writing as a process that allows free expression, deepens critical thought, and helps sustain a culture of inquiry and delight that is open to all. Thank you again for joining us for the 2021 Greensboro Bound Literary Festival. Please enjoy the conversation. Hi, everybody. This is Denise Kiernan, and welcome to this version of the Greensboro Bound Literary Festival. I am the author of Girls of Atomic City, The Last Castle, and most recently, We Gather Together. And I am joined by the always awesome Dee Watkins, New York Times bestselling author of The Cookout, The Beast Side, and most recently, We Speak for Ourselves. Uh, Thank you all for joining us, wherever you're joining us from. And Dee, thank you for joining me. Thank you for having me. Um, I'm, I'm really excited to have this conversation. I know some cool stuff is gonna come up. Yeah, yeah. And you know, it's interesting whenever we go out and you know, have to promote books, it's always a little weird, I think, to have to kind of stand up there on your own or worse, like now, like get in front of a computer screen on your own and just, talk about this book thing that's been in your head probably for years. It's always so much easier to be able to, uh, to be able to talk with somebody and have another author kind of talk to you about your work and what's going on. So I'm so glad you were able to join us from Baltimore. Yeah, it, it makes me feel pretentious. Like, you know, cause you go somewhere and you read and then you talk about what you do and people are watching and I just, I, I much I prefer I prefer the conversation because it kind of like you know it makes me and I feel like like one of the professors that I didn't really you know whose class I didn't really like in college like just the one who I have a sweater it's yeah. all about me and my sweater and you know <laughs> it's so true and you know what it's funny you say that about pretension because I am remembering. Um, I'm remembering when I met you. So we met, I don't know, five, six years ago now, maybe mm -hmm. more in Florida, because we were at the same, we were at this, both speaking at the same luncheon. And I remember we were, uh, and you might not even remember this, but actually I was reminded of it when I was reading, um, we speak for ourselves. <laughs> You'll see why in a second. So um, they were setting up the luncheon table so that we could get ready to have our our dry chicken or whatever it was <laughs> we were going to be eating and um no 
nobody was in there yet except me, you, the other speaker, and maybe and some of the hosts and things. And they were <clears throat> pouring water into the water glasses. And the glasses all had ice in them. And I remember somebody turned to you and said, oh, I'm so sorry. I, I poured this and I didn't ask whether or not you wanted ice in your glass. Do you want me to take this away and bring you one without ice? And you looked at him and you said, I'm not going to be that guy. <laughs> and that's when I thought, okay, I can hang with him. It's okay. <laughs> and and as, a, as, an, as a writer or a teacher or an author, you know, whatever, as a communicator, okay, all those kinds of teachers, author, they're all communicators, right? How can you communicate with people when you're coming at them from the look at my sweater angle? You know what I mean? It's like, how can you have a conversation with people? I think, you know, back then people didn't really pay me much to do anything, right? And then you, you, you write more books and you publish more articles and you go more places and whatever, TV appearances, and then people start to pay you. Like strangely, one day they wake up and said, they, they say, you know what? This person has paid their dues. Let's let's toss them something, right? Yeah, yeah. And you and you show up at the events and you, you know, same events, similar attire, same speech. It's just this time, instead of it being free, it comes with money. And when you are a nice person, you kind of let them down. Like you let them down. Like when you are really, really nice and you're really, really cool, it's like they want you to be like, you know, um, what's the the, uh, the the what's the joke they always make about the rock and roll group who wanted like red M and M's or oh, Van Halen, Van Halen. Yeah. They want yeah. you to have a little Van Halen in you, right? And I let them down. Like I'm sorry. Like oh, you're telling me that you're just gonna give me this plate of food that you know someone chewed up already? Okay. You know, I mean, I'm not going to eat it, but I'm not going to send you back to the kitchen because I don't want to be that guy. And, and um, you know, but I mean, you got to, you got to, you got to, you got to be yourself, you know. You gotta be yourself. And that's, but, that's another one of the great things about like doing these conversations is that when you go and do your own thing on your own, you're always you've heard yourself say the same words over and over and over again. And in your head, you're like, oh my God, Denise, I can't stand listening to you one more, <laughs> one more minute. Other people like it. <laughs> Other people like it. I know. I, I know. I know my wife is so sick of my jokes. Like what I try to tell her is like, these jokes that you hear, you know, when we gather together, is is not the jokes. It's not the jokes that that these these New York people know. And then guess what? These California people, they don't know these jokes. And these guys at this prison, they you know they you know. So yeah, you get sick of hearing yourself, but it just shows. I mean, um, and then maybe I do. Maybe I do need new material, but um, but I don't. I don't know. You know, I don't know. What's what's your world like right now? It is, um, it's a pretty nice day. I'm here in Asheville, North Carolina. That's right, I always like to say, you're in Baltimore, Maryland. Mm -hmm. I'm in Asheville, North Carolina. The festival is in Greensboro. So we're coming to you from all, all kinds of places. Um, you know, it's a, it's a good day and it's, it's interesting because I was thinking about, you know, how we wanted to do this conversation and, uh, and, you know, your, your book, your latest book takes place, you know, in basically in 21st century America. Um, and mine takes place in 19th century, you know, America. But I was struck, actually, when I was thinking about this, about actually how similar in a lot of ways the themes in our books were. And one of the things that occurred to me first and this is something that's personal for me, I think it's personal for you, is the power of storytelling mm -hmm. to lift people up and to give people voices and how books can actually change, books can actually change people's lives. Um, you know, uh, Sarah Josepha Hale, who's one of the main people in my, in my book, We Gather Together, you know, she's she's growing up in 19th century America and she's not allowed to go to school, but her parents fed her books and her older brother fed her books. And I know you talk a lot in all of your writing about the importance 
of stories and books and passing those on to people. Yeah, Hale already, it seemed like Hale had ambition in a sense of self and then her family gave her the tools um, through books because she wasn't allowed to go to school. She wasn't allowed to, you know, do a lot of things that a lot of us take for granted. But like, uh, it's a lot to unpack because she was just so persistent. <laughs> like, I mean, like, you know, like, it'd be really difficult for me to write a letter to Andrew Johnson, but we'll, we'll get to that. But she, she was, she was, she was, she, she was so persistent, and it was, it, it was inspiring. And I, I think, um, I think you make you make a great point because it's just um the power of, of story, but then the power of, of reading as well and what it, it could actually do. One of the things that made me laugh a lot when I was reading your book was, I was like, damn, how did Denise get so much information on this lady? And I literally can't find a document on my grandfather. <laughs> like, I can't, <laughs> like, I can't find, I can't, I'm writing this book on fatherhood. And I'm like, man, well, maybe I should start with my grandfather and then my dad and then get down to me. But there's no paperwork. Like there's no paperwork. Like you know, you you just you brought her you brought her to life so much that I felt like um I felt like I was I was a part of that journey, and it was it was it was beautiful. I love. Oh, thank you. And I I like that. You know, it can be really hard when you go back to um you know when you go back to you know the early 1800s, the mid 1800s, trying to bring people to life when there weren't even photographs of them you know mm -hmm. and one of the good things about her was that she was so prolific I mean this was you know this was like you know we were saying she grows up she's not allowed to go to school her parents feed her all these books her older brother gets to go off to Dartmouth but then he comes back and he acts like a mentor to her Mm -hmm. When he's home on, on vacation from college, so Hale's older brother is teaching, giving her like his version of the education he's getting at Dartmouth. He's sharing that. So again, that whole concept of mentorship and giving back that you talk about so much in, in, in your work as well, and you do it in your own life as well, I should point out. Um, you know, and then she, you know, she goes on and she ends up, marrying someone who also values books and education and reading. And I love one of my favorite little things, I know, you know, you, you know, you and your wife are so tight and me and my, my husband are so tight. And it's so important um, to find partners in life who value you and want, you know, to raise you up and help you be a better person. And I found Hale and her husband's, um, relationship really inspiring in that respect their little study hour they had at night yeah he 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 pushed her to write and i thought that was rare because uh, when i read that i was like wow and i'm checking the years again because i'm you know you always think about that time as so many men you know being like a woman's places in the kitchen um men you know <laughs> men in no, Congress. We still have that problem. <laughs> like something that Mitch McConnell probably said yesterday, but like, but like, you know, everybody was my Mitch McConnell back then. So you know, you would. I was I was shocked when I read that, and I, I thought it was I thought it was extremely progressive. And I think um, if if I was if I was thinking about some of the work that I do now, um, that is a permanent part of my conversation. Um, Maya Angelou said, when you get gift, you learn to teach. We have to share our experiences. We have to share what we like, what we don't like. We have to share why. We have to do self-work to understand why. And we have to give that power to other people. I've taught um, middle school. I've taught high school. And I've taught college for a really long time. And, and what I will say, um, and, you know, from middle schools in East Baltimore to I taught at Johns Hopkins University and I will say that like what all of these different people from these different places have in common is that so many of them are operating on ideas that aren't their own 
because yeah. even though they were able to, you know, get into these pre prestigious institutions, um, I'm at University of Baltimore right now and I'm seeing the same thing, class, race, whatever, all of these different people, are they don't have their own ideas because they're not doing that work. They're not getting the chance to fall in love with books. You know, opportunity and privilege can land you here or it can land you here, but everybody's going around thinking like everybody else around them. And um, I think they were extremely rare. And that study hour makes you rare. It does that. It forces you to think and to be able to move at a, at a higher level. It does. And so you can just picture, you know, Hale and her husband sitting, you know, by candlelight and, you know, from eight to 10 every night. And, you know, one day it was botany and one day it was French and one day wh whatever else they had there. And because they were both interacting with those words in their own way, then a conversation comes out of that. And then as you relate to other people over the power of books, you develop your own opinions, you develop your own views, you develop your own perspectives that you can then go ahead and share with others. And it was, it was so, you know, it's, it's, it's heartbreaking that she, you know, had such a short amount of time with him because, you know, he died like so many people did back then in the, in the, you know, 1800s from pneumonia. And so there she is, you know, widowed with five kids, the last one born right after, you know, his father died. And because her husband had encouraged her to write and because people had given her books and allowed her to take, like you mentioned, that ambition and gave her the tools to do something with them. Now she starts writing, which was not necessarily, you know, expected of her. And she did it because she needed to put, you know, she needed to put food on the table, but, you know, she- How would they do that as writers? <laughs> <laughs> we write because we don't like having food on the table. <laughs> <laughs> but someone will pay us to talk and give us dry chicken for lunch at a luncheon. Yes. <laughs> um, but, you know, she doesn't. Sorry, go ahead. No, no. Yeah, yeah. She doesn't just, you know, stop there. You're talking about, you know, and you, you know, mentioning Maya Angelou as well, the importance of teaching. So not, and, and giving other people the opportunity to shape their own narrative. And she ends up doing this, you know, she publishes her first novel um, and gets enough attention. She gets asked to, you know, edit this brand new ladies magazine, but she could have just kind of said, oh, well, I've arrived and I'm going to go do my thing now, but she doesn't. She like, tries to lift other people up and help them tell their own stories. And you talk a lot, it's one of the things I liked a lot about We Speak For Ourselves, you talk about the importance and the power um, and the empowerment of crafting your own narrative, of taking control of your own narrative. And as an artist, you know, I feel like, especially coming out of a city like Baltimore, um, when I was trying to get established as a writer, I didn't really have many, I didn't have mentors or I didn't have people to teach me how to get an agent, how to agent my agent, how to, you know, um, navigate through the publishing world, um, what a proposal should look like, what a contract should look like, how does it work? Like, I didn't have any of those things. I had a couple of people point me in the right direction, but like, um, I didn't have a fraction of the kind of guidance that I give to the people who I mentor. I, I truly believe that that is a part of your body of work. Like we write these articles, we write these books, um, we, we, we do these TV shows, but at the same time, you know, we need to groom the next generation of artists so that they can have opportunities too. So if I'm frustrated about representation and not having the ability to tell the stories I want to tell about the places in the neighborhood that I love, well, how much of a jerk am I if I let that die with me? Right. I work hard, I work hard, I got these opportunities, and now all of these kids are reading these books, right? I just, We Speak for Ourselves was um, One Book Baltimore, which means, um, <laughs> and they changed my subtitle, but we'll get to that. Um, oh, really? oh, 
don't even start with me in subtitles, please. Yeah. I mean, they literally changed it from the hardback to the paperback. They changed the subtitle, but we'll we get to that. That book was, was one book, Baltimore. And Tell I, people a little bit about what that is, because I was so excited when I, I saw on IG when you were like, oh my God, one book, Baltimore. Tell people a little about what that is. Those are such powerful programs in various communities. So it's, it was a really big deal for me because in a book I talked about how there was like three consecutive years of me being promised to have my work added to curriculum. And like I said, I'm not a pretentious guy. I'm not the guy who writes a book and says, um, you need to add this. Every student should be learning this because of, you know, me and this alleged sweater that I, I just had this dusty t-shirt. But um, I'm not pretentious like that. So the students were re re requesting me like crazy to come to their schools. I was getting so, I was getting like my biggest fan base were students in high schools all across Baltimore City to the point where so many teachers started teaching my essays. They started teaching my books. And they started doing GoFundMe's and they started doing what they had to do to raise money to put the books in the classrooms. And I was, luck I was lucky enough to be um, selected to represent Penn Faulkner in schools. So Penn Faulkner started buying a lot of my books and giving them to schools. And I would go to them schools and I would talk to kids. So it was a beautiful thing. And the problem was kids started stealing the books. So when they started stealing them, I'm like, damn, they're not stealing Things Fall Apart, even though that's one of my favorite books. They're not stealing that. They're not stealing The Crucible. But they're stealing my books, so we should be able to do something about it. And the school system agreed, bringing me in, letting me know that they want to partner with me to make this thing happen. And then just different ways, like rejecting me, like, oh, well, your book has profanity. Um, we Speak for Ourselves actually doesn't have any, prof maybe like one curse word. And like the whole thing. I don't even. I don't even know if I recognize any. But you know, profanity. We could a long list of people who are in schools. Yeah. You, look up, you have to wash your mouth out after reading the book because it's like a lot of them. But um. It's still worth reading. Still worth reading. Yeah. But so so I was denied for three years straight after being promised to the point where I said, you know what? I'm just gonna continue. The the book is already in schools. Teachers already know. Students know. And I'm gonna make myself available because again, that mentoring piece that these students have never met an author before. Or like, I'm the first author that thousands of students in Baltimore City has ever met. So this is important to me. So I'm gonna keep going. And then some change happened in administration, and some changes happened at the library. And I get a phone call, and they tell me that they, you know, they want to bring me in. They want to make my book one book, one book Baltimore, which means every seventh and eighth grader gets to read the book at the same time. And and um, in Baltimore, that's like thirteen thousand, and they get to keep the book, which is important to me because most kids from Baltimore don't have libraries, so they get to keep the book and build and start their own library and. Um, this, the city also donates money to community programs that surround these schools so that they can participate and play too. So um, different nonprofits are out doing work with the book while the students are doing work. And I get to visit them all and run workshops and conversations and things like that. And it was, it was a big deal for me because um, when I was in seventh and eighth grade, there was no no writer ever came to my school and there was no book that I even remember from those grades. Um, every little kid or most little kids, we love books when we're little. We love Curious George and, right. you know, you know, we love Stone Soup and we, we love those books when we're little kids. But then in middle school, you give us, you hit us with these books that don't really connect to anything that we care about or have people that look like us or celebrate anything that's meshed into what we do. And a lot of us drift away from reading. And that happened to me, that happened to my friends. And as a result, by the time we got to high school, we weren't prepared. College, we weren't prepared. Real world, <laughs> put us in cuffs, literally. So like all of that stems from not being able to think critically and make good decisions. So we got to get them early. And once I, I, I learned that and studied that, um, I, I worked hard at creating for those young people, creating for the adults from my community who didn't grow up to be readers. And then it all came full circle when I got that honor and so many people were able to participate. And even though it was virtual, this was the most successful one book bottom one they ever had. So this was like the biggest. And, um, and um, you know, I'm, I'm hurt because I didn't, I didn't get a chance to physically visit these places because of COVID. But, you know, I'm still going to do what I can do 
for the school system and for the lot for the Pratt Library in Baltimore when this when this ends because I just you know we gotta we we gotta we gotta make those connections. You got it's so it's so exciting and I'm not surprised at how popular it is. And you you talked about just now and you talk about it in the book that like you said, you know, and you mentioned Curious George, which by the way, there are like four different Curious Georges in my house right now. Curious George is my spirit animal. Like he sits <laughs> on my nightstand, like that's Curious George is my guy. And, um, but we do, you know, either you get hooked and you have people who are giving you books that speak to you and you stay with it or you don't. And you didn't have that, but you talk in your book about be, don't, don't, don't make it out, make it better and be the person that you needed when you were growing up. And I think that's a really, I, that's such a universal message because we all remember what we needed when we were growing up. And there's nobody here who got everything they needed when they were growing up. There's always something you can give back and do. And to do that again, you know, with the power of storytelling, especially storytelling that speaks to specific communities in a way that other books that they've been assigned have not, is really huge because you, you were, I think it was, um, you were, you're, you saw a woman, the Sister Soldiers book changed mm -hmm. your, changed your life for you, like got you back into reading, right? It was, it was, and it was a mistake. My whole career in literature, every award that I've won, every place I've been, every book talk is all just a mistake. I was in a hospital and the nurse was reading a book that spoke to me and it's instantly redirected the course of my life. Any and everything I'm doing right now is a result of somebody <clears throat> making a joke with me, you know, and giving me a book. And me making a joke back because I, I'm a, you know, I like to think I'm a jokester. And, um, and she left the book and, you know, I fell asleep. And when I woke up, I started, you know, thumbing through the pages and I did not know that I could finish a book. I didn't have the confidence to really jump out there and just read, you know, uh, for fun. And it, and it, it, and that book, that book had did that to me. Um, it did that for me. And ever since then, my pathway has been guided toward literature. See, I love that. Again, and a woman, so a, a woman writer. So again, the parallels between you and Sarah Josepha Hale are just incredible, you know? Right. That was, that was, that was, that was big for her. Like I was, um, I was, um, Yesterday I was reading um, um, her the section you wrote about her will. Yeah. And um, who she was leaving her book to. <laughs> the whole like. Yeah, it was was, it was it was a big thing, and it's. I gotta tell you the um, that was one of the the biggest finds in all my research. Um, and see, now I want to help you find your, your grandfather. See, like, I love digging for that stuff, man. And like, one of the biggest, one of the biggest finds in my research was um, coming across, getting her will. And it's cool, because you can see like, her handwriting, she wrote it all out by hand. But like the long, the, yeah, almost the whole thing is just all the books she has, and all the writing she has, and who she wants to, to give them to. And you know, she was, Hale was really big into giving back and not just, um, here, let me write a check. Cause she actually is it's not like she was this super flush person. Mm -hmm. Um, but you know, it was giving back by giving other women opportunities to write, um, giving men opportunities to write too. One of my, one of my favorite stories in the book is when um, she, she publishes this, this writing by this young un unknown writer. Uh, and she says, you know, he's a little boyish and he needs to come along, but you know, he does show signs of real genius. And then she gets, oh God, but go ahead. <laughs> yeah. And then she, and then she gets, a, and then she gets a letter from her son and her son actually goes to West Point with this young man who wants to be a writer and it's Baltimore's own. Edgar Allan Poe, right? 
Yeah, that was that was I, I I thought that was amazing. It just made me think about how small the writing community can be as well. Now, obviously, she was on and he was still on the come up, yeah. but like the communities, the our community, once you really get into it, is 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 kind of small. Um, yeah, I think and she you know she, they, they, she gives these opportunities to people. Um, you know, publishing a bunch of women poets. You know, she 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 could have just used this. She ends up with this platform, you know, at the at the head of this of this women's magazine, really one of the most successful magazines of the 19th century. And she, even though she's a writer, she doesn't just use it to promote her own writing. She gives voice to all these other people. And I think that's another one of the things I I, I like so much about your writing in general, but um, ha uh, we speak for ourselves in particular, is the idea of, it's so hard in life when we feel like we're not being heard, when we feel powerless, when we feel like nobody sees us, nobody understands who we are. And you talk, you know, the importance of giving that voice to people who feel like they don't have one. And, uh, and it's kind of finding a way you know, like I said, she couldn't vote. This was, you know, this is the 19th century. She didn't, she didn't, she couldn't vote, but she figured out a way to not just get her voice out there about things that were important to her, but other people's. And you talk a lot about, you talk a lot about that, the importance of that too. Yeah, I think it's also like the beauty of a person, um, a determined person to work both inside and outside of systems. You know, like- That's a good point. You're not gonna- you're not gonna shift the world through policy and policy alone. You know, you're not gonna change the world. Um, you have more of a chance of changing the world from the bottom up and taking things into the hand, your own hands and, and collecting and connecting with people in your community because the people on the top, they don't know what the people on the bottom talking about. But um, I think um, um, the way she was educated, the way she ran the magazine, her career, um, her politics, um, what she chose to put in the magazine and what she chose to not put in the magazine, right? You say the wrong thing and you jump on one side of something, then you 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 kill your opportunity to get big, to get the, the overall message out because you, you you're turning people off. And some people would look at some people would look at that and be like, oh, this I'm not connected to this person, or this person's not saying what I want them to say. And it's not always about them saying what you want them to say, it's about the bigger picture. It's about the bigger picture. If the bigger picture was to create opportunities um, for women to publish, then that's the game. We don't get into politics. We get women published. And then you sort the rest of the stuff out, you know, as these voices grow, you create more power and then you can do that. And I, I, like, I, really, I really had a lot of respect for that because, you know, just like working around a lot of different activist communities has taught me and, or has, has showed me why so many missions fail why so many so many um so many so many efforts just don't work because you know you got egos and you got people who are just focused in on one on, on so many different things and we're not getting together collectively setting goals and then accomplishing them and i think um i think she's a true example of that it's it's more dangerous now because we have social media. So like if social media was out, they would have been tweeting that hell, like, you know, uh, public rights, this, this abolitionist, you know, something, something, something like, yeah, the, the, you know, and, and they would have been coming at her, but they didn't have that back then. So you, you got a chance to move without all of the noise that surrounds that. And I, I think about that a lot, but when you want real change, and she was a change maker in every aspect, up from literature to her role in the magazine to Thanksgiving, Thanksgiving, <laughs> Thanksgiving education. Thanksgiving, no, we haven't even talked about Thanksgiving yet. Yeah, the work at the work at, at Vassar College and all of that. So she was, you know, she was doing her thing, and you can't achieve that if you try to pander to everybody because you can't make everybody happy. So the smart thing to do is to pick a big goal and push towards that goal. And I think, I think that was, that was something that I appreciated too. And just let me know that um, when I hear noise or when I, you know, see people that, that feel a certain way about um, 
stuff that I choose not to speak on. It's you know, it's, it's not about you and you and what you think somebody should say. It's about you. What are you doing? And and she showed you know she showed the power of working versus just talking. <laughs> right. No. Exactly. And like like you, I love the little checklist you put at the end of your book about you know, are are you really making a different look at these questions? And you know, so much of activism is about action. And she was an activist in the truest sense of the word, not because she didn't attend marches, she didn't go to the women's conferences, she didn't do that, but she, she put her head down and she wanted women to be able to go to school. Like that was her, she wanted women to be able to go to school. She wanted people to have voices and she did it her way, um, but she just kept going and going and going and you know, I was researching her. I just, you know, sometimes I would look at all the stuff that she did and all the, this kind of nonstop persistence of hers. And I would just think, oh my God, what have I been doing with my time? You know, <laughs> I'm just like, I'm so slack. And, um, but, you know, you talk about social media and the noise and it can also be super curated noise. And when you get into like the way we take the way we act or the way we take stands for things so many times it immediately breaks down into us versus them. Mm -hmm. like, you know, she was this, but she wasn't a suffragette. So I don't want to have anything to do with, you know, us versus them, us versus them. And, you know, you, you talk about it in the book and it's so important. Like, are you coming at this from a we standpoint? Because if you can't see how making sure everyone gets an education benefits all of us, you're not thinking enough, you know? And I think with all the noise that's out there now, part of the thing that I find frustrating is it's so easy to curate that noise so that you are just in an echo chamber and you just hear what you want to hear all day long. And all you see is everybody agreeing with you and whether they're angry the way you are or happy the way you are or full of themselves the way you are, it's so easy to just curate your scroll and make sure nothing ever disagrees with your view. It's good and it's good, it's good for society because you're keeping people divided and dumb. And yeah. divided and dumb people don't spark revolutions. So <laughs> it's very good. It's, it's a very good strategy. It's a very good strategy for if you're against change then it's working. And at the end of the day, um, you know, the only people who are winning are the ones who own those social media companies. They're the, one, they're the, one, they're the only winners. They're the only, they're the only winners. It's, it's, it's sad, but I, I do think, um, I think, I think books, books like we gather together are gonna, are important as far as like, um, just inf information and understanding the power like the power we have as individuals in utilizing that power because we don't, we don't, we speak for ourselves too. Is we have power. Um, no, you don't have to build a hospital if you want to make a difference. No, you don't have to feed everybody in the world every day for the rest of your life to make a difference. It's something simple as cleaning, cleaning your own neighborhood, taking that into your own hands. Um, Helping an elderly person who's not getting visitors or who's struggling to do the basic things in the neighborhood. Um, I wrote about my friend Tony, who trains people in the neighborhood who can't get to the gym because our public transportation is so bad and don't want to go because people have abs in there. And that's, you know, <laughs> it could be like, you know, you could be a little self conscious about that, um, working the equipment and all of that. So, like, I think of people who, to just be active and do something and try something and how important that is and why we need to focus on that more because it's 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 it's, it's all we have um the long speeches and i give you know, like i said people bring me place to give speeches and i tell them like maybe three people in this room is going to take some of this stuff and do something with it most of you guys are going to have a good time tonight and then go home and you know be like I want to I want to hear a black guy speak. That means I made a difference, you know, yeah. back in the door, whatever the fuck I was doing <laughs> before that. And I don't I'm I'm I never tell people or, or try to push any type of agenda on anybody. I just tell people what I do, how I work. Um, if I can help you with what you do, 
or give some insight based on my experiences, that's all I do. And that's, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm content with some of the things that we've, that we've accomplished um, in my city. And I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, and I'm still working and I know that I'll be doing this work until I'm dead. And then hopefully some people, you know, will, will, will pick it up and, and, and keep going. And that's, that's all we can ask for. Well, and, and you, you talk about, basically you're talking about legacy, the kind of legacy that your action and your work is going to leave behind. So I think about so much of what drove Hale, because she, she was a widowed mother with five kids to take care of. So much of what drove her was wanting her kids to have an education, wanting other kids like hers to have an education, wanting them to have the opportunity she didn't have. And, you know, you as a new, as a new father with one of the cutest babies ever put on the planet. If you ever want to smile, go to Dee's Instagram feed and just look for pictures of the baby. And it's just like bright your day. Do you kind of feel like now as a writer that you're sort of like, your baby girl's kind of like, you know, what are you leaving behind for me? Like, do you sort of feel her watching while you write, sort of? You know, uh, the book, I'm, I'm, work, the, well, I'm working on two books right now. And a lot of times she's been in my lap as I've been sitting at my computer plucking away. Uh, That's just like Hale. You and Hale are identical. She used to write with her baby in her lap. Yeah, so... She was better than me because her baby was asleep. So if she would be writing, I got to deal with a kid who doesn't want to sleep during the day, which is good because she sleeps all night. She sleeps all night. Um, she takes naps sometimes, but she likes to press the buttons and, you know, and, and I do, I think about, um, I think about the world that, that I will be leaving behind for her a lot. And I think um, I'm proud that, me and her mom cared about these things before we even knew she was coming into the world. Um, I, I'm happy with that. And I'm happy that she's given us more of a, of a focus. And, um, and she is something that I didn't have. She's growing up. She already has over a hundred books and she's only, well, she, today she's 14 months. So she's 14 months today. Um, this is her first day on a potty too, which is funny. But um, <laughs> she's not there yet, but we're working on it. We're working on it. And, but this is, but she already has like more books than um, anybody I ever knew at that age ever. And she likes them. She likes to look at the pictures. She likes to touch them. She likes to thumb, thumb through them on her own. Um, sometimes she holds them upside down and she's like, e, e, e. And I'm like, okay, yeah, that's not what it says, but we working, baby. We working. We working. <laughs> I, just, I think it's important because books are going to be a part of her life uh, and have been a part of her life since before she was born. And now um, when she goes on to have her family and whatever she decides to do with her life, um, it won't be like she won't have to be surprised by a nurse passing her a book, you know, when she's in her late 20s. <laughs> she can just be getting, you know, it's, it's just going to be like a normal thing. And I'm, 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 I'll be forever thankful for that. I'm sure she will too. When are you going to let her read the cook up? Um, whenever. Like, I'm not. Um, I'm not. You know, I'm not. I'm. I'm not that. I don't think I'm going to be that kind of parent that tries to censor um, culture. Um, she'll understand. Um, you know, violence and where it comes from. She'll understand privilege and how it works. She'll understand. She's going to understand all of this stuff. Like and. I'm, I, you know, I've made an er, a early decision to, um, to just be brutally honest with her about everything, just so she's, you know, they're not, she's not in school in like Black History Month, and then like they post like former crack dealer turned philanthropist, and that's like me on the picture like this, you know, I don't, I don't want to freak her out, like <laughs> I don't want to freak her out, like so I want her to know Daddy was bad, and. and <laughs> He got his he got his life together and you know he, he gave back. <laughs> you know, isn't that I kind of want to see that poster now though, but um isn't that um but isn't isn't that much more empowering in a sense? Because you know we 
I've talked about um, how important it is to, in all the things, all the books I've done, history books I've done, I think contextualizing history and showing people with, with their flaws as well as, you know, whatever they've accomplished mm -hmm. is so important and it's so much more relatable. And, you know, because you, you even talk in the book about, and, you know, don't, you know, don't meet your heroes, you know, because you're going to be disappointed. And we have this, you know, it was a really funny scene, by the way. So, you know, we have, you know, we have this tendency, especially with history, I think, and I think we're all, I, I'd like to think we're starting to get better about it. I'd love people like Howard Zinn and the way he approaches history. Um, looking at, uh, you know, we have this tendency to want either people are saints or they're sinners, right? They were the good guys or they were the bad guys. Well, you know what? We're all a little bit of good and bad. And honestly, if, if you can highlight or at least give equal time to people's flaws and then show how they've evolved, that to me is a much more powerful, relatable story. I mean, you know, you, you, you show how, because you can show how people are capable of change and God, don't we want everybody to be capable of change? So I like the idea of daddy was bad and got his act together. That's a much more powerful story than daddy's a perfect guy, right? <laughs> I mean, come on. Daddy ate all his vegetables, like, no, baby. Daddy didn't eat vegetables until he was, like, 28. <laughs> but you're going to eat yours. <laughs> so I think... Um... I think I think about that a lot because you know I think um, some of my frustration with older people when I was coming up was this whole idea of I was perfect I did everything perfect I did nothing wrong and it's just like the phoniest way you can be like at the end of the day um, and you know I'm a new parent but you know I still feel like raising your kids there's some has some of the elements um, of being. A, a good husband, um, a good wife, or a good a good friend. Like, you know, not tearing you down when you do something that that I don't like, but just being there to support you to make sure you okay. Um, letting you know how that made me feel. Um, giving you my experience if I can relate, um, and 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 how I was able to move on and and focus on that healing process more than focusing on um who's right and who's wrong and who weigh what what mistakes because one thing about mistakes is that you know that's something that we all share that we've we've all made them i haven't seen this magical mistakeless person walking around um you know so um you know so like you, let me know. I, you know i feel like in, in my relationships like one of the, the key components um my healthy relationships has always been the idea of support over um condemnation <laughs> like you know because i see a lot of people just grilling people and shaming people and I, nothing ever comes from that so i'm i'm not about that and i'm happy that that hasn't been like a trait um that i've ever really had um when i knew stuff or when i didn't know anything at all that was just never my thing and i'm, I'm, I'm happy about that the mistake yeah me I'm, I'm the same way and i one of the phrases that i like best um that i feel like i've only heard you know somewhat recently that i've only started to use somewhat recently is calling people in as opposed to calling people out Next. yeah i like so, that you know it, it's not that you're not going to you know you're going to disagree with people people are going to do things that you don't think are okay um, but there is a way to call someone into a conversation that might actually result in positive change might not you know but it might as opposed to just flaming them calling them out you know burning them to the ground and just you know showing how you know right you are in the process because yeah that mistakeless person doesn't exist and i love telling you know i love saying to people at, at talks you know if if we only wrote history books about you know perfect characters there would be a lot of empty libraries and a lot of empty bookstores because they don't exist and that relatability looking for the relatability and the commonality 
Um, it's easier to just get pissed off at somebody and, and, and rag on them about whatever it is you don't agree with. But looking for the relatability and the commonality between people you would think would have none, that's a much, much more powerful message. And I, you know, and if it's something as simple as, you know, wanting an education, I mean, whether you're a 19, whether you're a 19th century woman living in New England, or you're a 21st century kid living in Baltimore, wanting an education, wanting someone to value your mind and to give it the tools that it needs to move forward. That's, that's a, that is a universal, that is a universal theme. And there are so many themes and this is one of the things I like about history, and I know you're a big history fan too, is you can, there's so much you can see from the past that just resonates today, every, you know, constantly. But I like that. I'm going to use that. I'm going to use that. I'm going to quote you on that. I'm going to use that when I go upstairs. Um, my wife is going to be like, uh, do you want the rest of that smoothie? And I'm going to be like, you know, you should call somebody in before you call them. <laughs> I can't, I can't wait. I can't wait to just insert that into my conversations and um and uh, with no context yeah, <laughs> and no, no connection. Yeah. The less, the less, less, the least amount of context is always the best. Yeah. No, I remember I saw this in, in um I was on a Zoom I was on a Zoom call and it was like a panel about um uh it was a it was a it was a panel it was a, a social justice panel or you know something and and someone in the chat um someone in the chat and you know the chats can be public or you can contact people privately mm -hmm. and uh one of the people one of the people being interviewed was a formerly incarcerated individual and somebody in the chat said um you know it's so great i'm glad we're getting an opportunity to you know hear from from former felons now Somebody in the chat called them out and said, don't call them former fel felons. They are formerly incarcerated people. And the moderator of the panel said, you could have done that privately and educated that person and let them know there's another way to refer to this individual who's sharing their life with us. But instead, you chose to call them out in front of everybody, which was hundreds of people on this call and possibly, you know, so it's like, there is always people are going to mess up. People are going to say things you don't want to hear. And there, there is a there is a positive way to communicate that. And there is a not a positive way to communicate that. Sometimes it works. Sometimes it doesn't. Look at us learning the Zooms. <laughs> right? Oh, my God. I know. Right. It's educational. Um, so, you know, and to me, like whatever your thing is, is is your, you know, is your thing, you know, for Hale, it was education and she wanted Thanksgiving to be on the same day. Mm -hmm. And she was, she wanted people to come together and, and give thanks. And I think her, you know, we know today how important gratitude is, right? The, some of the most important, who's the most important prayer you can say is thank you. You know, it, gratitude is a, gratitude is, we know now, um, you know, and I, that's why I wanted to talk about this at the end of the book. It's not, you know, Thanksgiving is not an American thing. Giving thanks has, has been, is a, is a universal concept. It's been on this planet as long as humans have been on this planet. And there are inspiring ways to talk about giving thanks. And we know now that it's, it's you know, it, it's good for your health. It's good for your blood pressure. It's good for your mental health. Um, and, you know, you talk a lot about, you know, you're being thankful and that's part of the motivation for wanting to, to give back to your community. And even when people thought, people always thought you would, because now you're, now you're Dee Watkins, right? You're the New York Times bestselling author and you do the TV and you do all this, that you would just leave, right? You just put Baltimore in your rear view, in your rear view mirror, but you didn't want to do that. This is gonna suck if this video comes out and I'm in LA next week with like shades on, like new home. <laughs> well, hey, then I am not calling you in. I am calling you out. <laughs> it's not. It's not. It's not gonna happen. But what I will say is um, one thing that I just want to close with because I know we're getting close. I know we're like 
be running over time, but I, I, I want to make sure this is in there, is that reading your book made me think about a woman in Baltimore named B. Gaddy. And for decades, she's passed away. Um, I, was, I, was, I was good friends with her son, Tony Laws. He's passed away too. But um, he, got, he, got, he was murdered actually, but she died of natural causes. But for decades, for decades, um, she was from East Baltimore, Collington and Fayette Street. She received national attention for feeding every homeless person in Baltimore every Thanksgiving, um, every Christmas Eve, every Thanksgiving for decades, for decades. And it made me think about her a lot. And, you know, um, she's just been on my mind a lot because um, she's an amazing person. And we used to, I used to volunteer, used to, you, we used to volunteer there as kids because you needed it for like um, hours to, um, to graduate high school. So that was like one place we can graduate, we can, we can vol do volunteer work at because she eventually ended up opening a homeless shelter too. But as I got older, I would still go back and volunteer every once in a while. And when I think about um, why giving, it has always been a part of me. It's because of what she did, what she created and what she instilled in us. So like, um, I was thinking like, you know, with all these Confederate statues in these different cities coming down, like, you know, crazy, we had Confederate statues in Baltimore, which is so weird. But, uh, <laughs> you know, but um, I'm like, yo, we, we they need to erect one of her because she was truly a legend and just put on for so many people. So I definitely wanted to make sure I close with that because it's just really important. I love it. I have nothing to add to that. Please look up when you can. B-E-A-G-A-D-D-Y. That's a great story. B-E-A-G-A-D-D-Y? Yep. I love it. B. Gaddy and Sarah Josepha Hale. Two awesome women separated yeah. by, I, I mean, that is the perfect, I, I cannot think of a better way to, to end our little day here at uh, Greensboro Bound Literary Festival. And hopefully so, we get to do this in person. <laughs> yes, my God, please. If you come to Asheville, I'll go to Baltimore. We got to make this happen, man. We got to make this happen. Um, thank you so much. Well, this was so you. much fun. This was so much fun. And thank you, everybody, for, for watching. And, and thank you, Greensboro Bound Literary Festival, for, for celebrating books and the people who write them. Yeah. Bye, everybody. Peace. Thank you again for joining us for 21 Conversations. If you enjoyed this presentation, please like and share with your friends and fellow readers. One final reminder that Greensboro Bound is a nonprofit organization committed to bringing together readers and writers throughout the year at zero cost to our community. Please help Greensboro Bound maintain that commitment with a sustaining or one-time gift now. The number to text to give and our website are on your screen. Thank you. We look forward to seeing you in person next year at Greensboro Bound.